Hi, Misha here, and continuing to look at British Royal Navy ships from the Eagle Moss Collection, one 1100 scale diecast models. And there's only five in this collection, so yeah, nothing like the Japanese, but there you go. A while back, we looked at the um, HMS Dreadnought. This is one of the few collections that even has a diecast dreadnought in it. And last time we looked at HMS Hermes here, the first aircraft carrier. And now it's time to look at one of the most famous British ships, or even infamous, HMS Hood so-called Admiral class and there's even debate battle cruiser or battle ship there's a lot of debate about this model you, even before she was made her inception was under debate her existence was debated her purpose debated what to do with her debated 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 much like with Hermes, she would be the only one in her class. However, originally, there were to be four Admiral class cruisers. We had Hood, of course. We had Rodney. We had Hal. And we had Anson. Now, Rodney would get its chance quite soon with the Nelson class. And Hal and Anson would have to wait to the King George V class. but So they would get their own ships. But it would ultimately be the only Admiral class the hood here. So yeah. Talk about developed in World War I. Sent around the world more than once during the 1920s. Used to patrol off of Spain during their civil war in the 1930s and used at the beginning of World War II before she was horrifically sunk in just a few minutes by the German battleship Bismarck. So, let's talk about the Hood. Hood. The Mighty H. Not heroin, no, Hood. Named after Admiral Samuel Hood of the 19th century. The design concept dated back to 1915, so early in World War I. It was initially to be an improved Queen Elizabeth class battleship with more modern armor and especially attention given to torpedo defenses because well German U-boats they also wanted it to be able to draw as little water as possible and the first design proposal was submitted at the end of November that year and then there was a lot of back and forth over what to do. So the first proposals were a very large vessel, very heavy, but also quite fast at 27 and a half knots, fast for that day. The Admiralty actually wanted a smaller ship and was okay with 22 knots. So this was back and forth for a while, but then Admiral Jellico was given a peek and he basically said, I have no use for this. I have plenty of battleships, but I maybe could use a modern battle cruiser because, hey, those Germans, they're up to something. I've heard that they're making some new slick battle cruisers. So with this and some others, another proposal came in February. And the ships were officially ordered on April 7, 1916. And then the first three were ordered specifically on April 19th. The fourth one would be ordered a little bit later. And 
hood here would be laid down for the first time on May 31st, which was the same as the Battle of Jutland. Now, at the Battle of Jutland, you may debate if Britain or Germany won, but one thing that can't be really debated, British battle cruisers lost. They suffered the ha heaviest casualties there, with three of them being sunk. So immediately work on the three new ships was suspended, pending reviews of what happened at Jutland. And this quickly resulted in proposals to update the design in June and July. One was a little less radical. Another one really wanted to heap on the armor. And this is what they would go with. Now the original design they had picked in April was capable of 32 knots. Quite a blistering speed for 1916. But when they went to the heavily, more heavily armored design, they sacrificed one knot, bringing it down to 31. So with that, Hood was relayed down on September 1st, 1916, and her sisters would follow in October and November. But, moving into 1917, they were soon suspended. Because, after Jutland, the German High Seas Fleet was pretty much going to to stay in port had seemed to be effectively bottled in but what they had done is it increased U-boat attacks which meant Britain was losing more and more merchant vessels and of course then the US came into the war on their side bringing their own battleships long story short there wasn't as much of a need for battle cruisers or battleships however you'd like to style it but what they needed was merchant ships so Hood was allowed to continue because she was the furthest along, and she was kind of an insurance policy, just in case the Germans did end up cranking out some newfangled battle cruisers. Admiral Beatty, as an interesting thing, was, was a big proponent of keeping Hood as a priority and actually starting up. Admiral Beatty was a big fan of the Admiral class. Not only did he want to give Hood a high priority, he wanted to actually start up the other three again but this didn't happen although they did continue to tinker with the armor layout throughout 1917 and 1918 and then in August of 1918 Hood was launched and they would again continue to tinker with the armor adding even more even after World War I in 1919 actually sacrificing about a quarter of the secondary battery. They had other changes they wanted to do, but they realized they just couldn't do them on this design. And that was kind of the problem. After Jutland, they realized, even though the Admiral class was very modern for 1915, he was already looking outdated by 1919. So with this in mind, the other three ships were officially cancelled. Hood was allowed to continue, but they knew it had shortcomings. And with that, in January of 1920, she was kind of uh, launched for a second time where she was fitting out to move to a different berth to free it up for merchant use. She would continue finishing her fitting out and then she would go into sea trials that spring. And she would be commissioned into the fleet on May 15th, 1920 and immediately be selected as the flagship of her Division. So what exactly is Hood? Well, as I said, there's a debate. Battleship, battle cruiser. Typically a battle cruiser is faster and has the armament of a battleship, but maybe lacks some armor, whatnot. A battleship is more heavily armored but slower. And to the British, anything that was going over 24 knots was a battle cruiser, automatically. But the Americans thought of Hood as a fast battleship, a relatively new concept in 1920, and one that 
you'll see pop up more and more with, of course, the Iowas, but also the Congos in uh, Japan would be turned into fast battleships. So it became not so much 24 knots, but 30 knots as they cut off. So really by most metrics, this was a fast battleship, at least in the 1920s. And it was also the largest warship afloat and the most powerful, or at least one of the most powerful at the time, and it would remain pretty much a pinnacle of the battleship craft for 20 years. She's much larger than previous classes and types, like Renown and Queen Elizabeth. She's 860 feet long. She is anywhere from 41 thousand tons, pretty much dry and bare bones, up to nearly 47,000 tons deep loaded. Her crew would fluctuate between a little over 1,300 and a little under 1,500, depending on when, where, and why. She was designed with a maximum speed of 31 knots, but actually during sea trials she would exceed 32 knots. Her main armament were eight 15-inch guns and four twin turrets. Pretty standard. Her secondary armament was originally going to be 16 single-mounted 5.5-inch guns, but in 1919, four of these were removed to add armor, so that was 12. And she would start off with four anti-aircraft guns, and this would, of course, be expanded before and during World War II. She originally had two flying-off platforms for a fairy flycatcher, still one of my favorite names, <laughs> planes. But in 1929, during a refit, these would be kind of removed or plastered over, and she would be given a crane and whatnot, and a catapult, kind of a folding catapult, for other aircraft. But this wasn't very successful. In fact, it was quickly removed only a year or two after being installed, and I'll mention why in a minute. She had good armor. She had good torpedo protection. They had very much increased the armor around her magazine. She had an armored deck. They really did what they could with the design. Again, Jetlin. But they also knew they could not incorporate everything they really wanted to or should because the design was already too far along. But World War I is over. They had this brand spanking new battle cruiser b battleship. It's the largest and one of the most powerful in the world. What is Britain, what is the Royal Navy going to do with it? Well, they did what any kid with a new shiny toy would do. They took it around and showed it to all their friends. So after the usual extended trials and shakedown cruises and fixing faulty, low-quality labor that happens on all ships, in 1921, she started to really show the flag around. She would go to Brazil and the West Indies. And that was a success. She would also be used in the Mediterranean for training in this era. And then in November 1923, she would join Renown and some other ships and go on a 10 month long world tour. And she would literally go around the world, stopping in all kinds of places. Uh, British colonies, also former colonies like the US, Canada, Australia. And just allies. She would return home. September of 1924. And then in 1925 she would start her tradition of spending the winters in the Mediterranean. Something she would do multiple times. She would be at various coronations and other political events. She was basically sent when Britain... Wanted to do a little bit of intimidation, but honestly, she was more of a diplomatic ship, showing more of the grandeur of the British Empire after the Great War. 
kind of Britain's still here, we're still powerful. But Hood was not perfect. In fact, she was quite far from it. There were several issues, but the biggest ones, the ship was heavier than designed, which means that it floated lower in the water than designed, and when traveling especially at high speeds or in less than great weather, she took water on board. That's why she was known as a wet ship. It doesn't mean she was excited, it means a lot of seawater got in, in her, either just straight water, spray, whatever. This is said to have led to higher incidences than usual for diseases, illnesses like tuberculosis, and just general damp and discomfort of the crew, and of course it's always harder on machinery as well. So this was a problem. Also that, that catapult I talked about, they installed it, but they also discovered Hood couldn't use it unless it was just in perfect weather, because if there was any bit of wind or rain or waves that were high, the catapult was just not safe to use. So that's why they went ahead and just basically pulled the whole system off or didn't use it after around 1933. She also, you know, after a decade already of being sent to and fro, her machinery was starting to wear. That's why they had a major refit between 1929 and 1931. She came back out, became flagship again, and was, uh, you know, kind of doing that stuff. She started going back to the Mediterranean in the 30s. But then, she got a new assignment. In 1936, just before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, she was assigned officially to the Mediterranean fleet, and she would do non-intervention patrols and escorts and whatnot around that area. In 1937, she had a minor refit in Malta. Now, originally she was fitted with six 21-inch torpedo tubes. They would delete a couple of these during this, also installing different AA guns, things like that. But she hadn't really had just a major, complete rebuild. Keep in mind, she's 1916, 1917 tech, so by 1937, it's outdated. And again, she's just seen a lot of miles, basically. They were going to send her in for just a total rebuild and modernization, kind of like Japan did with the Congos, and like Britain had done with other ships like the Queen Elizabeth's. But that Spanish Civil War kind of kept Hood needed down there. So instead of getting her refit in 1937, she was scheduled for a complete rebuild, extended time in dry dock for 1941. That was the next time that the, a large dock her size was available. Now she did go in for a minor refit at the beginning of 1939 at Portsmouth and she was released on August 12th from this but even when she was released in August she wasn't a hundred percent not even close she still had faulty equipment she still had some damage for example way back in 1935 she had a incident where HMS Renown rammed her didn't do a lot of damage but you know was a little bit she just had scrapes and scuffs from an act of life, and was just wearing out. But, she was the best thing Britain had until the King George V were coming online. They did have the two Nelsons, but those are treaty ships. Hood was bigger, more intimidating, and I think it just, it was, it was a point of national pride for the UK. They wanted what they thought of as their best ship down there. So, of course, August 1939, war was about to happen. And they, they needed Hood. They needed their, their H. They just couldn't afford to have her in dry dock for a year or more at this point. So, once again, she's sent into 
action. At the beginning of World War II, Hood was kind of operating in the area between the UK and Iceland. She was given convoy escort duties. She was assigned to look for blockade runners trying to get to her from Germany. And of course she was sometimes charged with trying to track down commerce raiders and other miscreants. It's actually during an uh, escort mission for a damaged submarine that she was spotted and attacked by some German Ju-88 A's and was hit by a 500 kilogram bomb. I mean, it's 250 kilogram. Anyway, hit by a bomb, which did more damage. And believe it or not, her already wearing out engines didn't get any better darting around the North Atlantic at high speed during stressful situations. Her top speed was already down before everything to about 30 knots and would get down to 26, 26 and a half knots. She's just wearing out. They need her, but she's just not in, in, in shape to do it. Nevertheless, she does what she can. They are able to put her in to dock for a quickie to at least fix some of the biggest issues beginning in April of 1940. But they have to get her out as quick as they can because of the situation in France. She's out by June 12th and again she's not at all fully repaired. She still really can't, she definitely can't get up to 30 knots. And uh, yeah. She is assigned, along with Ark Royal, to head up Task Force for Operation Catapult, which is to deal with the French Navy at the famous Battle of Mers Kabir. And there she would trade blows with the French battleship. Dunkirk, they would, uh, yeah, they would fight each other, and Dunkirk would uh, straddle her, and some of the crew would be hurt by splinters from near misses, but on the other hand, shells from Hood would do pretty significant damage to Dunkirk, so much so if they hadn't beached her, she probably would have sunk. So she was involved. Now, when Dunkirk's sister ship, Strasbourg, made a run for it, Hood did her best to chase, but she pushed it up to 28 knots and just completely wrecked her engines, especially one, one screw. So, yeah, she got away and Hood had to uh, return to port to kind of patch things up in August of 1940. But, guess what? They still needed her because they were worried about a German invasion. August of 1940 is kind of the height of the Battle of Berlin, and Hitler had every intention in his ludicrous mind of invading the United Kingdom. So in September, they mustered up every warship they could in the Channel to try to defend against a potential invasion, which obviously didn't come. But they didn't know that, so again, she was sent for patrol and whatnot, limping along that September. And once it was clear Germany wasn't going to invade, she was back to convoy escort and patrol duties that October. Throughout October, November, December of 1940, she would do her patrol and escort, and then whenever the report would come in of a German warship spotted like at Moskir or Skarnhorst or Gnezina. Oftentimes Hood would be sent after him running and it was either they were too late or the report was faulty but more and more sea miles on her and she's really breaking down so again they had to put her into port for emergency uh, repair in January She's released in March of 1941, but the, the dockyard rates her condition as poor. 
So they release her, but they know that they've only put a band-aid on. They're still just hoping to get the five King Georges in service, <clears throat> or at least more than one. And then they can put old Hood up and give her some TLC. But for now, she's just going to have to toe the line. Again, in, in March, she is sent out after Scarn Horse, and nothing much happens. And in April, she's sent over to Norway because there's rumors that Bismarck was making a break for it into the North Atlantic, which leads obviously into the Atlantic proper. And if that happens, a ship like Bismarck could run amok. So it began. Hood rushes up there. Nope, Bismarck is still at port. So she will return to her own port at the beginning of May. But then another report comes in that Bismarck is, is going for it. And this time, for once, it's real. And originally Bismarck was going to sortie with quite a large contingent, but it ended up just being herself and Prince Jürgen. So Hood was sent out with the brand new, just commissioned over here, HMS Prince of Wales, the second King George V class. So they were sent out to hunt the Bismarck. And for once it would not be a dry run, much to her detriment. On the 23rd, two British cruisers would spot and track Bismarck and Hood and Prince of Wales were coming in hot and fast. Well, Prince of Wales was coming in fast. Um, Hood was certainly hot, um, but not maybe in the, in the best ways possible. <laughs> But they were holding her together. You have to give credit to the seamen in the dockyards that kept this old war horse even viable. So, there is that to be said. Thus, we get to the Battle of the Denmark Strait. When I was a kid, the way documentaries and books would talk about the Prince of Wales, it almost made it sound like a heavy cruiser. But actually, the King George's the most advanced battleships that the UK had during World War II and very capable if not perfect but still lighter than the hood and absolute tonnage but again more much more modern but they only did have 14 inch guns hood had 15 and to be honest especially at this time in 1940 hoods guns are more reliable they fired nearly a 2,000 ton shell. They had 30,000 yards range. Early in the morning of May 24th, the British units spotted the Germans. But they didn't get the jump on them. Actually, thanks to new hydrophones in Prince Eugen, the Germans had known they were coming pretty much all night, so the Germans were preparing. Hood spotted Bismarck and Eugen just before 5.40 that morning. And at 5.52, they opened fire. And both Prince Eugen and Bismarck would target Hood. And actually, Prince Jorgen would be the first to get a good hit on Hood, starting a fire on her deck. Nothing critical. I mean, she's a warship with a heavily armored deck. At least, it was heavily armored by the standards of 1919. It is worth saying that by 1941, with her slower speed, and her armor was not made to go up against newer 16-inch guns, she really might be more of a battle cruiser. It's still debatable. But, yeah. 
So yeah, she gets a, a hit, but nothing bad. Right around 6 o'clock, she's making a turn to bring her rear turrets to get a broadside on. And the luckiest shot in the world for the Germans from Bismarck, and the most unlucky for the British, hits. It's a little bit debated if it hit one of the primary 15-inch gun magazines, or if it actually hit one of the secondary battery magazines, which went up and then took one of the 15-inch with it. But what's clear is the aft battery went up. Huge explosion, monstrous explosion. The ship broke into two pieces and then sank in just a handful of minutes. Of her crew of over 1,400, there were three survivors. It was that quick. Even with an allied ship nearby, it just wasn't any time. And to Prince of Wales' credit, she did attempt to carry on for a minute, but it, the cards weren't in her favor, so she had to withdraw. But of course, it would not be long before her sister ship, King George, and Nelson's sister ship, Rodney, would exact revenge. Not long at all. But it still didn't change the fact that Hood was in pieces at the bottom of the ocean. She was aged, but she was the pride of the British fleet. The largest battleship they ever made and ever would make. She had served for two decades. She had been the symbol of British power. She had had a lot of political ceremonies, coronations, anniversaries on board. She had been praised by many foreign dignitaries. She was just, she was a symbol. Her loss was more of a, a symbolic loss. Plus, of course, the, the lives of the sailors, including the Admiral on board. But it also galvanized the Royal Navy. But the ship was not perfect, and... Bismarck's shell exploited a flaw. It was a one in a million hit, but it did exploit the flaw in her armor scheme. And for years, decades, a century nearly, it was debated exactly what happened. There was even thought for a time that maybe her own torpedoes, which she still had some on board in 1941, might have been detonated. But that seems to have been dismissed now. It does ultimately seem like her rear magazine detonated. Now, what exactly led to that can be still a little bit debated, but, yeah. Yeah, the only one of her class, the only one of her type, never to be seen again. You know, in a way, Jellicoe and even Beatty were right. She was ultimately sunk by a newfangled German battleship, battle cruiser, you know. That she did her best, but it just wasn't. It's also a little bit sad that her really, her only major combat engagement was against what should have been an allied ship, the French Dunkirk. She never really got a chance to do much against German ships. And they never really got to that refit in 1941. They had big plans. They were going to put in new turbines, new boilers, new secondary guns on new turret mounts and all kinds of new equipment, radar and all that. But it just never, it never happened. That's kind of the problem when you put stuff off. But again, the Royal Navy felt, Britain felt, they really didn't have an alternative. They just didn't have a excess of battleships in 1939-1940. After the London Naval Treaty and the Washington Treaty before it, they had been on a building holiday for a long time, and even the couple they built, like Nelson, were treaty ships, which... Nelson was a good ship, but that's a story for another day. But she was a treaty ship. But yeah, one of the most iconic naval vessels, not just in Britain, but in world history. 
along with Bismarck, of course, and Missouri and Yamato. And I'm sure I'll revisit the hood and other videos, but just felt like talking a bit about her tonight. So I appreciate you staying with me. If you could like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you very soon next time.